I'm going to show you the game between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Christoph Duda from the penultimate round of the Tata Steel tournament. So going into this round, it was very tight at the top of the tournament. Carlsen and Geary were level with uh, Nippon Nishi just behind them, half point behind. So Magnus realized that he really had to play for a win in this game. Well, he would do normally anyway, but um, this was his big chance. He had the white pieces and Duda, well, of course, a very strong player, 20 years old, he's Polish number one, um, but still not in the same class as Magnus, not just yet at any rate. So Carson with the white pieces. Interesting to see his choice today. Well, we know he can play any first move, e4, d4, c4, knight f3, but today he plays d4 and he's goes for a very theoretical opening, actually. He doesn't always do that. Often he likes to avoid these main lines and play some quirky anti-theory line. But this variation of the Vienna, the Vienna variation um, is very popular at the moment. And particularly this pawn sacrifice, actually. Um, and, well, in the past, Knight c3 and bringing the bishop back to e7 has been played. Um, but the big guys these days are just retreating the knight. So white is a pawn down, but has an obvious lead in development. Um, bishop g5 has been played in the past, but the current fashion is to play queen a4 check which obviously forces the move knight c6 to protect the bishop here. And earlier in the tournament, we saw Mamadyarov against Duda. Uh, Mamadyarov played bishop g5 for that game, petered out to a draw. Carlsen played knight e5, threatening to exchange the knight here and take the bishop. And rook b8 from Duda, which looks very unusual indeed. But actually, it's a very clever way of protecting that bishop, because if knight takes, pawn takes, and you can see the, the rook protects the bishop. Um, white can take this off, but, well, in this end game, white doesn't really have much advantage there. Uh, d5 has been played previously in this position, but again, nothing really special. Uh, Magnus played a new move here, rook d1, and this rather threw Duda, who thought for uh, 21 and a half minutes in this position over his next move, Carlsons. I should say that Carlson was just whacking out his moves, playing so quickly, um, and obviously that's rather intimidating for his op opponent. Not that this gives White any huge advantage, but what Carlsen has got here with this little raid by the Queen is he's got an unbalanced position and a position which is more familiar to him than his opponent. And, well, in modern chess, where, of course, all the top players are analysing with computers, that's basically the best that you can hope for, really, is just to get a position that uh, is more familiar to you than your opponent. Exchange on d4. Now that drags the rook up the board. Um, and this next move, bishop c5, looks a bit strange to me. Um, queen e7 looks better just to get the queen out of the line of the rook. The problem with bishop c5 is that it puts the rook where it wants to be. You can see the queen and the rook lined up again against h7, and this is tricky. And Duda makes a mistake straight away. Um, it's still playable for black after bishop c6. And then an interesting move is to play a4 here um, to, well, just start to get some play on the queen side. You can see the rook is actually in the perfect position to support that pawn rolling down the board. But Duda played h6, and, and 
well, Carlson thought for about nine minutes here and took the pawn. So pawn takes bishop and queen d2. Well, it's pretty obvious what's going on. Uh, White wants to de deliver checkmate. And there's really only one sensible way to defend against this, which Duda found. Knight here, and after queen takes, which looks um, terminal, but isn't, because black still has bishop takes pawn check. Now that bishop has to be taken, because otherwise the rook would be taken here. So king takes and then queen f6 check, forcing an exchange of queens. And in this position, uh, black luckily can recapture a pawn, because black doesn't need to take the queen straight away, but instead rook takes pawn check, and only then knight takes queen. So material is balanced, but actually white has a clear advantage because Black's king is still in a little bit of danger here. There's, there's a nice initiative hitting the knight. And king g7 from Duda protecting the knight. And then rook f3 threatening a check here. Duda played rook g8. Now, it might seem as though it's possible to... Um, in this position, win material. Um, this looks absolutely dreadful. Um, if the knight moves, then rook takes pawn. But bishop c6 from Duda. Now, a couple of continuations here. Carlson took the knight on f6. We'll come to that in a second. But if rook g3, which looks very tempting, then the king goes back. And after rook takes knight, in fact... Black is okay in this position after this. And rook c2. And, well, one of these pieces is going to drop. So in this position, Carlson, after... Well, he just checked all the details of those lines and took this. And now we have... A very tricky endgame, which Carlson definitely stands better here with white, with bishop and knight against a rook. But this is very hard to play, because the crucial thing when you have minor pieces against a rook is that the minor pieces must have solid support, either from a pawn or another piece, possibly the rook more often with the king. Um, and, and this is particularly tricky with black's rooks so active in this position, obviously the rook on the seventh. So white has to play so prudently here. Um, I remember Spassky saying in a similar endgame, well, an endgame where you have a, um, a rook and a knight, um, he said, you have to play like an oil tanker. It's a phrase that, that's always stuck in my mind. I'm sure I've used this before. Some of you might remember this. Play like an oil tanker. That means you have to play absolutely solidly with white. Otherwise, you could even lose this. So Carlson started with rook f2. So he understood... He needs to solve the problem of his king. He needs to make sure that he gets rid of that rook. One asset, of course, he does have is that past a pawn. So if he can get things rolling, if he can, well, exchange rooks here and get the pawn rolling, then decent winning chances. So the rook came back. And now I was sort of surprised that he didn't play bishop b3 here actually because that's really solid protection for the bishop but perhaps he was worried about this um, and the bishop being pushed away again um, in fact it's still alright for white in this position 
you know, and that would be a reasonable way of playing. But, well, I understand. Uh, and instead he played this. So he, he has thought of another way to secure his minor pieces. And that's with a4. But this is tricky. Well, it's all tricky now. Um, if that's taken, of course, then rook c8 for the skewer. So the bishop dropped back to e2. And rook f3 supports that minor piece. And now Duda takes the, the chance to advance his pawns in the middle of the board. And I can tell you, I if I were playing white, I would be concerned at this point. But Carlson, well, he is a very cool dude, it has to be said. And he played this incredibly well. So the bishop is protecting that pawn. And although this looks very strange, putting the knight back here, when it treads on the toes of the bishop, in fact, he's making room for that rook to come over behind the a-pawn. And in fact, well, I mentioned at the start of this endgame that white needs to find solid protection for those minor pieces, and the king can help with that, although it does feel a bit precarious to, to self-pin in this way. And now Carlson takes steps just to make sure that those pawns aren't rolling forward any further. The g3 pawn, of course, secures the f4 square and h4. And Duda puts the rook um, blockading the a pawn. And now h5. So Carlson is getting things going, but this is so tricky. Um, I mean, there were other ways to play here. Knight c3 is possible. Um, bishop e2, that's another way of sort of unraveling um, white's pieces uh, and perhaps putting the bishop here. I suppose the only thing with putting the knight on c3 is that it commits the knight to one side of the board and... Well, even if that bishop manages to go to b5, then the rook could swing across to attack that pawn. Um, so, well, I can understand why Magnus played king d2 here. This was move 41. They've reached the time control. And he basically makes sure he's expelling that rook. And the rook came back. Now, he doesn't want to play bishop c2 because that will allow the rook in. And that that is dangerous. So he repeated the position, and this time put the king back on c1, and then the bishop on c2. So instead of putting the knight on c3, it goes to this square f4 to support the pawn here. And now another switch. It's this position needs so much patience. Um, and we know that's a real skill of Magnus, of course, or a quality, I should say. He is incredibly patient in these endgames, but you need to be. I can think of very few players that would have the stamina to actually win this position. But Carlsen is going to try. Now, if that king comes in, well, we can check it away and then put the rook behind the pawn. In any case, Duda played rook h6. And now there are some really tempting continuations here for white. Uh, g4 is a tempting move. And then to take here, but okay, that's still tricky, and then you've got to deal with the g pawn. A waiting move is, is very interesting, because just rook e2... Because, oh, here's a funny trick. If c3, then g4 is very strong. If pawn takes pawn, then 
it's actually checkmate. There's an amusing finish. Um, so rookie two is an interesting waiting move, but king d2 played by Carlson also very tricky. Uh, he's tempting black into pushing c3, and then once again this is a threat to play g4. Uh, let's go back. Uh, Duda played rook e5. Check. And then the king, well, in a moment, <laughs> came up to c3. And Carlson has found his feet again. Now it's very difficult. Um, in a moment, he managed to switch the rook over here. If black tries to stop that with rook, whoops, rook b8, I beg your pardon then you can see that well, white is getting there. That's a threat. And if here, then this is actually very good for white with this threat. Okay, let's come back. The game continuation, rook g8. And after this move, it's looking very good for Carlsen. So threat to play rook b5 check here. So rook takes pawn and bishop takes pawn. So this is the trick. And this totally liberates white pieces. Uh, obviously, if pawn takes, then rook b5 skewers king and rook. So bishop, rook e8 and knight f4. It's still very tricky, but Carlsen manages to negotiate this phase of the game very well. And here's a very nice move. If, if king takes pawn, then rook e5 is still a bit tricky. King d4 played very quickly by Carlsen prevents black from playing rook e5. And actually now white's pieces combine beautifully in an attack on black's king. Um, you can see if... Well, let, let's play this out. This is fun. If king c7, we give a check. The king goes back. And voila, rook b8. That's the kind of trouble that black can land in. And even on this side of the board, also uh, really perilous for black's king. If the king comes to e7, then this is disastrous. Um, well, the King f8 is the best move here, but I want to show you another checkmate, which goes like that. Um, so after knight e5 check, king g8, knight c4. Now this is definitely winning. And basically white just needs to hold everything together. Um, it, we're back to Spassky's oil tanker business again. In fact, that's, that's really the strategy throughout this endgame. Um, and that is a really nice move, making sure that black's king is cut off. It just avoids lots of nonsense. And here, for example, well, black can enter into um, a rook and pawn endgame like this, but it does no good at all when the king is a million miles away. to exchange rooks to try and bring his king over but to no avail knight a3 was the final move of the game just making sure that the rook can't block on the a file and this pawn is flying so for example let's bring the rook back and here here and on the next turn, we're going to play bishop e4. And, well, I'm sure Magnus is able to checkmate with bishop and knight against the king. That's a joke, by the way. Of course he can. Um, so there we go. Going into the final round, Magnus leads the tournament. And, uh, yeah, his rivals faltered at this point. Um, 
Uh, Nipomnishi lost to Sam Shankland. Sam bouncing back after his disaster in the previous round, resigning a drawn position. Well done to Sam. I'm really, really pleased for him. And uh, Giri drew against Radyabov. Radyabov offered a draw in a really promising position. Uh, he seems to have a problem with confidence. So anyway, going to the last round, Carlson a half a point clear of Giri. Those are the uh, there's no one else around him, so that's the only game that matters. The final round game, Giri against Carlson. Giri can win the tournament if he beats Carlson. Can he do it? Let's find out soon. Thanks for watching.